Hey guys, Kill Stokes here. Welcome back to another episode of the Trading Coach Podcast. Today, I'm going to share with you a very important lesson that may prevent you from blowing a lot of money and may even prevent you from blowing your entire account. Now, before we hop into it, I want to send you a quick reminder. We've been running a two-week free online trading workshop called Bridging the Gap. I'm assuming you guys are in the mix. I'm assuming you guys have registered that you've attended it. Um, but if for some reason you haven't, maybe you're just stumbling across this podcast, today is the last day you can register. The event ends on the 12th. Wealth. But if you register right now, you'll get your login. You'll be able to go in and watch all of the recorded sessions so you can catch up on everything that you miss. So head over to www.tier1trading.com. If a pop-up doesn't come up because we shut it down, just enter tier1trading.com backslash BTG. Register now before we take it down. That way you can catch up on all of the goodness. Now, I got a really cool lesson for you guys today, and lessons like these are really the reason that I started the Trading Coach podcast in the first place, right? I didn't start this podcast for, you know, really any other reason aside from having a platform where I can share my experience, right? I've been doing this trading thing for 16 years ago, and many of you guys don't know this story, but I initially had no intentions of coaching at all, and kind of the only, you know, I'm not, I'm still not big on social media aside from like shameless promotion type stuff, but the only reason I had a presence on social media and, and by what I mean by social media back then was a blog was because my trading coach encouraged me to journal. He encouraged me to write a diary and track my thoughts and my feelings and all that fun stuff. And, you know, being an ex-athlete, um, I wasn't really good at that type of stuff. So I decided to start a blog where I would share kind of like a day-to-day -day journal of my experiences. And lo and behold, the, the blog became pretty popular, right? I soon found out that I wasn't the only struggling trader. There was lots of people like me. And the messages that I had as I was going through the journey were very relatable. I was making the same mistakes and dealing with the same hardships that many other traders were facing. And they really enjoyed that I was talking about. And again, this was a, a different time. This is, you know, still early 2000s where, you know, I, I like to think we've played a role in changing the dynamics of how trading is perceived now. I think there's a lot more people preaching realistic expectations, preaching realistic journeys and whatnot. Um, but back then it was all get rich quick, right? Forex was still somewhat new and it was the wild, wild west of, of scammers and people trying to steal your money. So, Everyone out there, the, the general message that they were hearing was, hey, you know, put a little bit of money in, make a lot of money back or give me your money, your secret strategy, $99 EA or 1999 EA and stuff like that. No one was really kind of saying, hey, it's hard. Hey, I sucked. Hey, I lost money. Hey, I blew an account. But me. So I, I really kind of grew my following initially off of being the bad trader, the struggling trader. And it's something that I like to keep going um, because, you know, despite being in this game for so long, I think people should still be up to date with my journey because my journey is ever growing. It's ever evolving. I'm, I'm not done. I will never be done. Um, but it's also very helpful for me because it gives me a chance to kind of decompress and unwind and, and again, continue to share my thoughts just in an audio mean. So I really appreciate you guys supporting. And I was cruising around the internet today doing a lot of uploads. I just put out a, a weekend uh, trading edge video. So I was doing the normal promotional stuff on social media and I came across a cool post. You'll probably see it as a, a piece of micro content in the near future. But if you can visualize this, right, it's two pieces of pizza, right? One looks yummy and delicious on your left. The one on your right looks burnt and crisp, right? And basically on, on top of the first pizza, the nice, lovely one, it said basically put in the oven for 25 minutes at 350 degrees. The one on the right that's burnt and crispy and disgusting says put in the oven for 10 minutes at 700 degrees. And at the bottom it says few processes cannot be rushed. And the point that I took from this message is that everyone wants to be quick. Everyone wants to have speed, right? We're kind of in this thing where it's like, you know, work hard over work smart. I know that dynamic is kind of changing a little bit where, but people are like, hey, let me work as hard as I can and do things as quickly as I can to get that instant result. So 
instead of putting a pizza in the oven for 25 minutes, I can cut that time in half or even more than half if I put it on a higher temperature, right? And have it done in 10 minutes because I, I want that pizza now. However, the result of doing so is a ruined pizza. It's a burnt pizza and it's a complete, not even, not only a, a wasted pizza, so wasted money on the pizza, but wasted time as well because now either you get nothing from that 10 minutes um, invested or you got to go all the way back probably make the same mistake three or four times trying like little degrees like hey what if i do 15 minutes on 600 what if i do 17 minutes on 550 right you spend more time doing those little tweaks because you still want that get richness or that get rich quickness um and then eventually you have to go back to find that magic number of 25 minutes at 350 degrees and you know you've wasted all that time kind of playing around for the shortcut when if you would have just did things the right way the first time you would have had your result. And I bring that up now because I have been testing all day. Well, not all day, for a good part of the day. I went on a, a very long run this morning and destroyed my legs and I decided to have a second wind and play with my kids at the park for two hours. And when I got home after that, I said, I am not moving from this chair. And so I went into some back testing and strategy development. I had an idea that I wrote down last night, had the look through a few reference guides, a few books I had. Um, cool book that I uh, was looking at today was called The Little Book of Currency Trading, How to Make Big Profits in the World of Forex, called Kathy Lynn. Um, it's not a great book in the world. Maybe if you're a newer trader, it's a great book, but it was there for what I was inquiring about, which was a, a Bollinger Band strategy, which I visited or, or, uh, about a year or so ago. And I was doing some initial testing on this, um, and let me tell you, I, and it could be complete dumb luck, but I picked the right year at the right time. The first year, just the first year on a single pair, I produced 1,120 pips. Now, I haven't converted into percentages yet. That I go through a process where I like seeing pips and win percentage first because I know ultimately in any strategy I test, there needs to be a tweak. And by knowing these numbers, basically how much I made, how much I lost, what my win percentage is. I kind of know what area I need to attack. Do I need to increase, try to increase the win percentage by adding filters? Do I need to try to add maybe a, a break even rule where I can lower that average loss? Or do I need to have a different place for average loss? Do I need a target two for runners, right? You know, this is just kind of my method of, I know that the first time through strategy development and back testing, it is never going to be the say all be all. So I run what I call a baseline test and the baseline test is kind of the, the bare bones of the strategy. And then I can lock in because I've been doing this for a very long time. I can lock in at the specific thing that I can tell needs to be tweaked. And then I you know, kind of go back and forth through the process until hopefully I find something that works. More times than not, it always fails. That's just the, the harsh truth about strategy development. But the cool thing is if you can find something that works one time and, and not literally one time on your chart, but one time that work, one thing that works for the strategy, then you can use that strategy forever. So that investment is worth it. But I looked at this thing and I said, 1,120 pips, woo, right? And what's funny is, yeah, that's the exact voice I used as well, woo, right? Uh, the funny thing is, right, if I would have done this, Years and years and years ago, I'd be doing backflips. I'd be on Amazon. I'd be on whatever auto, uh, you know, car dealership. I, I am looking for the next car. I'd be spending my money before I even made it. Right? I'd be that excited. Fortunately for me, the the, the reality of, of trading for 16 years and and kind of understanding what is realistic and what's not realistic, and and it's it's kind of killed my excitement. I kind of always expect the worst. Um, and lo and behold, when I did the next year, I don't have the stats in front of me right now. I, mean, I don't have it kind of added up. But the next year, basically, my, my running total went from 1,120 all the way down to where are we at here, all the way down to 600 pips, basically. So uh, the next year blew half of the profits from the previous year. And that was expected, right? That's why we always want to run multiple years of testing. The, the goal of back testing is, right, because any strategy can get very hot during a single market condition. The key is you want longevity. So you want to test your strategy and make sure that it, it works or works good enough or can withstand, can survive, maybe that's the best word to use, can survive different market conditions. So you're, you do well during your really, really good years because we always have good years, but 
you don't give too much back during your bad years. You kind of tread water and hopefully you have another pair in your portfolio that kind of makes up for that. And, and that's the power of creating a smooth equity curve. But the point is, the old me would have done this. And I know I would have done this because I actually did do this. And I know many of you do this as well, right? Because again, you don't want to let the pizza sit in there for 25 minutes. You want to get that pizza ready in 10. So you go through your first year of back testing. You see this amazing result, 1,120 pips. And you say, man, I ain't wasting no more time back testing. I'm going to start trading live because this system works and I want to make money as quickly as possible. And what happens? You start trading live. You know, maybe you hit one of those hot years, but right. If, if the strategy doesn't actually work the way you thought it would, and this is just kind of a, an outlier year, you start trading live money into, you know, into a market where it's destroying your system because your system isn't yet tweaked and, and really form fit it to work the way you want it to. And you lose money. Either you lose a significant amount of money to where you have to stop and start over. Like I said about the pizza example earlier, or maybe that's all the money you have and you blow everything. And I see this time in and time out. It used to be the thing where traders would give me so much, so much mouth over back testing. Why do I have to back test? It's a waste of time. Why can I trade live? Don't I get real experience? Back testing isn't the same as blah, 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 blah. All these excuses, right? And I've kind of won them over, right? Me and a handful of, of other professional traders out there that are preaching the right message, right? We've kind of won them, won them over. We've got more and more traders understanding that, okay. I need to do this back testing thing, blah, 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 blah. But they still haven't committed all the way. They're just dipping a toe in the back testing waters. You got to jump in the back testing waters and commit to doing the whole thing the right way, right? Um, they're dipping a toe. They say, okay, I'll meet you halfway, Akil. I will back test. I will do this back testing thing and data collection and all this stuff. But I'm going to do enough just so I can say I did it, right? You guys ever do that in life, if anything, where it's like, you know, I just did that with dishes right now. I'm going to, I'm going to talk low because my wife's upstairs hearing me, but like I did like two dishes and, you know, I've justified myself doing dishes. I'm going to go back and do the rest. I promise because she probably heard me, but uh, you ever do something like that? Anything around the house where it's like, yeah, I'm going to clean up a room and you clean up like a little part of the room. And you're like, ah, you know, good enough. Right. And you get into trouble later. Right. Same thing with back testing. They do a year. They said, hey, that's enough, right? I got the numbers that I wanted to see because, you know, realistically, all these traders want to do is justify whatever they want to, you know, have as a result anyway. And then they hop into the live markets and they blow it all. And I hope this goes as a warning to you guys that are out there. Don't make that mistake. Again, part of this Trading Coach podcast is learning from the mistakes that I've made in the past. I have made that mistake many times in the past. It wasn't necessarily with back testing, um, but it was kind of, shortcutting my demo trading period where I told myself, hey, I'm doing three months of successful demo trading before going live. That first month would be on fire. And then I would go live and then I would blow the money the next two months and start all over and be like, okay, really this time for realsies, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go three months and I would go like two, a month and a half and I'd be like, ah, I'm going live. I'm missing all this money. And then I blow it all the next month and a half. Then I'd be like, okay, I do two months. I'm like, ah, two, close enough, two out of three. Right. And then blow it all. Right. I, I did that consistently. Right. Don't be like me. Don't be like the old me. Be like the new me. Um, but take time. And what's important to remember is this, right? Don't do it fast. Do it right. You know, I'll leave I'll leave you guys on this. I was having a conversation with the men's group at my church the other day. We were talking about appliances, right? Buying appliances for the home and that we had just replaced kind of our, our washer, dryer, um, oven, um, all this type of stuff. And when we were making that decision, the first thing we always think about because we're frugal is we let's go cheap. What is the cheapest possible? Matter of fact, I gave this example, right? Years ago when air fryers came out. Right. I didn't know much about air fryers. Everyone was talking about them. like, who knows? They could have been this fad thing. But, you know, so instead of making a, a big investment at first at an air fryer, I bought the cheapest one I can find because I just wanted to see if it was actually working. So I went to Walmart. I bought the cheapest one I can find. A lady gave me a, a nasty look. I said, don't judge me. You don't know what I'm doing. This is a tester. Right. Don't. This is how I get down. Um, and it worked well. 
that air fly fryer blew up in like, you know, whatever months afterwards because it was cheap, right? You get what you pay for. I then went back and got an expensive one and fast forward however many years later, it's still working 100% fine. Not a super expensive one, but a more expensive one, a quality one. And you got to look at your trading the same way, right? Are you going to take the cheap route? Are you going to try and shortcut everything, right? Because when you take shortcuts, you're going to get cut short. That is rule of thumb. You take shortcuts, you rush, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to leave screws out, things are going to break and you're going to crash and burn. If you take the time to do it right, right, a little bit more of a time and effort investment now is going to allow you to reap those benefits for a much longer period of time later. Trust me, I've been on both sides. I know which one's better. Hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Do me a favor, support this podcast by leaving me a rating and review. Also share it on your favorite social media platform. Show me some love as we look to continue to grow the show. Also, I got a YouTube channel. Check it out, youtube.com slash Akil Stokes. Daily videos on there, including my weekend trading edge, which is kind of the, the big weekend one where I give you an outlook on the markets for the week to come. Get over there, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. That way you don't miss my next video. All right, see ya. I'm gonna go wash these dishes.